Hello, and welcome to our webinar today, How to Use Digital Twins to Cut Time and Costs. If you want to know what the buzz around digital twins is all about, you're in the right place. We have Forrester and two of our amazing customers, JLL and CRB here today to share their experiences. I'm Sarah Sewanjandar, Director of Customer and Partner Advocacy at, Mar at Matterport, and I'll be your host today. It's my pleasure to welcome Paul Miller, Principal Analyst at Forrester, Chris Link, Regional VDC Manager at CRB, Rosendo Treviso, Product Director at JLL. And here's a look at our agenda today. Paul Miller will provide insights and trends surrounding digital twins. He'll share perspectives on where the market is today and where it's headed. You'll see the art of what's possible and relevant to really everyone, owners, operators, architects, engineers, contractors, adjusters, partners, developers, it's very exciting. Then we'll, then we'll launch into our customer panel and hear inspiring stories from JLL and CRB to hear how enterprises are using digital twins to increase productivity. And then of course, we'll save time for Q&A. And just a few quick housekeeping rules before we begin, questions can be submitted through the Q&A tab. My colleagues, Amir Frank and Kimmy Tran will be addressing them as we progress through the presentation. And of course, we'll save the best for last um, and go through some live Q&A at the end of today's presentation. And also the session will be recorded and available on demand. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to Paul Miller, Principal Analyst at Forrester. Sarah, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you in the audience as well for giving us an hour of your time. You're going to hear in great detail in the customer session how two you know, great organizations are doing this stuff for real and the real problems and the real challenges and the real opportunities they're seeing as a result. Before we get to that practical, pragmatic piece of the conversation, I'm going to take the conversation up a level and talk a little bit more theoretically about what a digital twin is and what a digital twin is not and then look at some of the ways in which it's being used as well. Can I have the next slide, please? So yes, as I said, what is a digital twin? What is it not? And then also looking briefly at some broad use cases around digital twin, which may lead us into the conversation with those customer representatives quite nicely. So this is Forrester's definition of a digital twin. I don't know about the rest of you, but I see a lot of material, a lot of marketing, um, a lot of hype, a lot of enthusiasm around what digital twin is. And it all gets frankly quite confusing pretty quickly. Um, is it just that pretty 3D visualization spinning in front of you? Is it something else entirely? Um, and, and with the hype and the, the noise, it can sometimes be hard to tell. So we've tried to clarify that a bit. Um, and particularly from Forrester's perspective, as we look at a digital twin, this definition really does capture what we think one is. A digital representation of a physical thing's data, state, relationships, and behavior. So that digital representation of a physical thing, that's the important piece here. And as we look across the space, um, having clarified what a digital twin is, and we'll get deeper on that in just a moment. But with that defini definition of a digital twin, we see clear enthusiasm to do something with it, clear opportunity to, to invest, to spend money to build these things, and then to start reaping the rewards as a result. And the graphic you're seeing on the slide here is from one of Forrester's assessments of a market space. This is what we call a tech tide. And in, in this particular case, I was looking at 20 technologies in the smart manufacturing space, which is where I spend a lot of my time. And up there in the top left-hand corner in that invest category, digital twin, sitting alongside things like industrial IoT and location-based tracking and machine learning and AI, but digital twin, the subject of today's conversation, sitting right up there. So high business value, and we're hearing this consistently and I'm sure we'll hear it um, from the customers today as well. But relatively immature. The solutions that are out there in the market aren't fully blown necessarily. They're, they're addressing segments of the problem and delivering pieces of the value. They're getting better every day. They're getting richer and more interconnected every day, but still relatively immature. So huge opportunity there for vendors like Matterport to jump in and, and, and offer value. And I said at the beginning, 
there's a lot of noise around digital twin. Um, hopefully, we're not adding to that noise today. Hopefully, we're bringing clarity to that to that conversation today. And you can be the judge of that in the audience. Let us know how we did. But as we look at this from Forrester, we look at all the different digital twin solutions out there in manufacturing, in building management, in healthcare, in retail, in aerospace, and in all these other um, market segments. We find six common key characteristics wherever we look for a real digital twin. And those six characteristics you can see here on the slide. And I'm going to talk about each of them briefly in turn. And shouldn't be any surprise here, a digital twin has to be a twin. There has to be another one. And in this case, of course, there has to be a physical one. So there are always two, one physical, one digital. And some of the, the richer sort of visualizations and simulations we see may have no connection to a real thing at all. And our argument is that in, in a lot of those cases, it might not, might not actually be a digital twin. It might be a beautiful simulation. It might be a very valuable simulation that delivers real business value, but it's not a digital twin. So to be a digital twin, first thing, you must be a digital representation of something that exists. The next piece jumping around the diagram is bi-directional data. And here, if you have a physical thing and a digital thing, they must talk to one another. They must communicate about what's actually going on. So the, the, the real world thing may use IoT sensors to report what it's observing. What temperature is it? How humid is it? How light is it? How much vibration is there? How fast am I moving? All these different measurements of the physical world being communicated back to the digital representation. And then the digital communicating back in the other direction. And so maybe the digital world has, has simulated the angle of the sun and the temperature in a building and has decided that actually the sun is about to shine right in your face in that window. Let's close the blinds. And so the digital sends the instruction to the physical that says, close the blinds now. And then that happens. Timely updates. In a lot of conversations around Digital Twin as well, one of the things we see come up a lot is this idea that it must be real time. There are telcos all over the world using Digital Twin as a driver for their 5G investment. You need 5G if you want a Digital Twin, they say. Um, not necessarily true, actually. And so in our definition, we talk about the importance of timely updates. And this recognizes that for some use cases, you absolutely need real-time connectivity and real-time communication between the physical and the digital. Imagine an autonomous car, for example, driving down the highway. Um, it's on the Autobahn in Germany. It's doing 150 miles an hour. It's going quite fast. It needs real-time communication from the digital simulation to tell it that actually there's a truck in front of it and now is the time to hit the brakes. You can't wait for a a, a slower update it needs to be real time. In other use cases, and the one that's mentioned here on the slide is in the airline business, you just need a timely update. If you are building a digital twin of how a jet airliner consumes fuel as it flies from London to New York, you need a really good model of how that fuel will be consumed. Absolutely. But you use that model to decide how much fuel to put onto the plane. The plane then flies from London to New York. You do not need to be updating the digital twin every millisecond as to how much fuel is being burned. But when the plane lands, you need to look and see how much fuel was left. And you compare that to the model. Was there more left than you expected? And therefore, actually, can you maybe carry less next time? Or was there less than you expected? And therefore, maybe you need to put a little bit more on next time to give you some padding. But either way, you're feeding that delta back into the model and refining it to understand better how fuel is actually burned on a jet airliner in flight. But you don't need real-time connectivity to deliver that value. If you don't have real-time connectivity, and I've just said you often don't need it, if you don't have it, you need an ability to maintain state. 
So the digital twin needs to have an understanding of what the physical twin was doing last time it checked in. And it also needs to be able to offer an observer some view of what it thinks the physical thing might be doing right now. So if we go with that jet airliner again, the digital twin was updated just before takeoff with how much fuel there was. Halfway through the flight, you should be able to look at the digital twin and say, I reckon we've consumed about a third of the fuel. That ability to see that is important. It's also important, of course, for the digital twin to be able to tell you that this is an assumption. This is a model. This is a prediction. This is not actually real. And to tell you, you know, I haven't actually talked to my physical twin for the past four hours. So this assumption could be four hours out of date. That ability is important too. The fifth of our six key criteria is this ability to model and analyze. You're gathering all of this data from the real world. It's one thing to report it back and to say, the temperature in this room is 24 degrees Celsius right now. That's useful, that's nice. Or you've consumed a thousand liters of fuel on your jet airliner, useful and nice as well. Much more useful and a much bigger piece of the digital twin story to be able to start predicting what will happen next. So it's 24 degrees in this room right now. The air conditioning is not on. The sun is shining in that window, in my face. It's going to get warmer. And I can predict how it will get warmer based upon where the building is and how thick the glass is and whether it's um, treated for, for solar radiation and all the rest of it. I might start making predictions about when to turn the air conditioning on to cool that room down as it warms up. But using the data, to make decisions and to, make, and to take actions in the future, a critically important piece of what we're seeing digital twins be used for. And then the final piece of the six is this ability to report, this ability for the digital twin to tell people what it sees. And this is where the visualization comes in. Things like beautiful Matterport um, point clouds or uh, BIM models or photorealistic visualizations, all of these are some of the reporting that can come out of a digital twin. Just as valuable though, might be a text message to a field service engineer saying, service the HVAC on the 23rd floor, it's about to break or it's broken. That's just as useful a reporting output from the digital twin or a graph on um, the chief executive's desk that shows him how much um, money he's spent on air conditioning in the building this week. I, just as useful an output. So visualization is one piece of the story, but not all of it. And without all six of these working together, is it a digital twin? So what is a digital twin not? Just very briefly, and next slide. Two or three things it's not. Firstly, and I've, I've already said this, it's not just about the visualization. Visualization is important. Visualization is incredibly powerful, but it's not the only piece of the reporting from a digital twin. It's not all virtual. And again, this is a point I've made before. This, this connection to the real world and this constant updating between the physical and the virtual is important here too. Otherwise, it might just be a simulation. And again, that is not useless. That is a very powerful, very capable thing, but it is a simulation, not a digital twin. And I think that, that the final one of these, what is it not? It's not ever finished. Like painting the fourth bridge in this picture, um, constant process of updating and refining and improving that twin. You're constantly getting new information from the real world to update the model. You're constantly pulling in new data. You're constantly refining and improving models to predict uh, what your next best action should be. Those get better over time. The insights you can offer out to your users get better and richer and more capable over time. So a digital twin will not be finished. It will be, it's a living resource and a living um, environment in which you can work and extract value. So just very quickly, uh, I want to look at three broad use cases 
for the digital twin and jump on to the next slide, please. And the first of these is in the design phase. And this is where we see a lot of interest from, from purveyors of CAD solutions, for example, and getting involved in, in building these models of how a physical asset will perform in the real world as the first step in you know, designing it, building it, and then operating it in the real world. And if we jump to the next slide uh, with just one example of this design twin piece, understanding how physical systems will actually work together. Things like collaborative design reviews as the, the construction team and the, the electricians and the fire safety team and the water management team all come together and see how their pieces are actually going to fit together. Seen some really nice examples of this in building nuclear submarines here in the UK uh, just recently, um, where you know, the, the, the team that was running water pipes and the team that was running high voltage power lines weren't actually aware until they saw it virtually that high pressure water and high voltage power lines came a little too close together. And actually, it would make sense to move them apart a bit. And in this particular case, we're looking at on the slide here. This is the fire management team for a new building, looking at how um, sprinklers and uh, evacuation routes and other pieces of the fire safety um, infrastructure for the building will work together alongside other aspects of that design. Second of these use cases is around the process twin, actually operating this stuff for real. Once you've built it, how do you actually run it? And how do you gather data to optimize that running. One example of this, and this is quite a recent one, this is BMW, the car maker. And they've built a digital twin of um, some of their plants in Germany. And they're using that digital twin to understand how the plant actually works today, but then to optimize it for future use. Working out where the robots should go to carry parts, working out whether the work cells in which humans are, are, are building cars are optimized. Um, so looking at you know, how far forward does a worker have to lean? How far do they have to step to move from one task to another? And using the digital model to start tweaking some of those pieces to optimize it. And they're then carrying that through into redesigns of the plant. Really, really interesting, really nice example that they're working on. The third piece, the service twin, actually using all of these data, using all of these insights to deliver value to end customers. This is Schindler, the, the elevator maker, and they're investing heavily in IoT, uh, Internet of Things sensors in their elevators and escalators and other moving um, infrastructure to understand how those assets actually perform in the real world. You know, they know how they should perform. They've tested them in this tower several times, you know, what it's meant to work like, but gathering that data from real world operation, real world use to understand how they really perform and then gathering data on individual elevators as well to say, you know, elevator number three in building 27 is vibrating a little bit more than it should. It's probably worth sending a service engineer out to take a look before it breaks. Really interesting example of pulling these, these data flows together. Again, you need all three of these, like the six pieces of a digital twin before, you need all three of these to deliver that value with a digital thread connecting them together. So in theory, at least, the data coming from the service twin, that real world view of how an elevator is performing in your building right now, should feed back to the design twin to improve the design of the next generation of the elevator, in theory. We don't see a lot of it in reality yet, but lots of theory. One of the challenges, the big challenge in Digital Twin at the moment is that most of them are still vendor specific. So Schindler builds an elevator and comes with a Digital Twin for a Schindler elevator. The Otis elevator next to it has a different Digital Twin. And that's okay for the vendor, for Schindler and Otis, because they are using it to understand their own assets and how they perform. But for you as the building operator, it's entirely unhelpful. You want to understand how your elevators work, whoever they are from. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of interest at the moment in this notion of a complex or composite digital twin 
that pulls together data from different vendors and different assets to give you a view, a view across the entire building or the entire manufacturing process or the entire jet aircraft. And at the moment, relatively early days on that, but that's where we're seeing a huge amount of investment right now. And with that, I am done and we'll hand back so you can hear from the customers about how they're doing this for real. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for providing that glimpse into really all of the opportunities and trends ahead. As we segue into our customer panel, I just wanted to pause and extend a big Matterport style thank you to all of our global customers and partners. Um, it's really you, our 404 subscribers who have digitized over 5.6 million spaces that are defining our journey ahead together and all of the opportunities um, in front of us that as Paul described. We are so excited for our customer panel today. We have Rosin Rosendo Treviso joining us from JLL, one of the largest commercial real estate companies in the world. And we have Chris Link from CRB, a leading consultancy in engineering, architecture, and construction, specializing in biotech and pharmaceutical industries specifically. So let's take a look at how digital twins are redefining their client engagements and, op and operations at the moment. So Rosendo, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Sarah. Absolutely. So JLL has actually been one of our first customers since Matterport launched as a company about 10 years ago. And I feel like that's a very important distinction to make um, as we launch into your case study here, because like businesses everywhere, JLL has faced some headwinds with the pandemic, but you were able and, and you're actually better prepared than most um, as you as we headed into the pandemic, because you were already using Matterport to enable clients to virtually tour commercial properties anywhere in the world uh, without having to visit in person. Can you share with the audience um, how JLL has been creating a really um, differentiated and engaging way um, to experience uh, commercial real estate using Matterport as well as a lot of other um, market insights and data that you provide? Well, we, we developed an application back in 2016 called um, Next Office, which allows us to uh, connect our clients and our brokers together uh, by the use of technology. Um, we have um, four countries in uh, Europe, um, plus one in, in Asia Pacific connected to the system that allows them to intera interact and also being able to see properties um, in what we call virtual viewings uh, by using Matterport. Uh, the advantage of that, as you, as you correctly said during the pandemic, was the fact that we're able to actually, instead of bringing the clients and the brokers into our rooms across London, Paris and, and Madrid, where actually the brokers were able to actually go online and invite, effectively using Zoom or, or other techniques to, to share the same experience and without having to actually move out and, and actually continue working in a more of a zero touch type um, experience with, with our clients. So let's, uh, should, we, should we jump in and take a little demo here to show us how you're actually helping um, executives all over the world find their right yeah. properties? So, so we have a number of um, rooms. Um, this was the first in Paris, um, which has you know effectively five screens. This is in L London as well. Uh, the five screens connected. This is in Madrid as well. Um, this is the new ones, the new one in Frankfurt in Germany. And effectively, you can see that there are a number of screens that allow viewing of properties. And you see uh, using Matterport in this case. Uh, and actually, the clients can actually navigate and see the details of the of the uh, properties in that way. Not only across. Um, the country they are looking at. This is the case of London, for example. We're looking at 40 Broadway, um, and the whole building is actually mapped and and uh, captured. Uh, as you can see, the idea was to to show the whole wealth of the building, especially if we're dealing with this with this particular asset, but also being able to actually identify um, every one of the areas as well. So um, this building also is going to be redesigned, so it's actually absolutely critical that um, that we have um, this completely mapped. Um, and you saw, I mean, you know, I will show on the, on, the, on the video as well, that all the floors are there as well. We can actually go up and down on the floors. Um, 
obviously needs a lot of work. We can actually do measurements as well on plan view and also doghouse to actually give us the full view of the whole surface as well. And it was critical to actually being able to understand the size and understand, you know, share that with our clients as well. And this is why it's so important to use Matterport with NXC Office. Absolutely. Um, so tell us a little bit about, and you have the, the digital twins, so when they come into the next office or if you're, if you're interfacing with them on a remote basis, you know, what types of other, um, you know, data are you supplying with clients so they have really the whole, the whole picture of what, what's Correct. possible? So effectively, obviously, all the financial um, details as well, but we, we also overlay additional data, which is actually location data related to demographics or uh, sustainability um, data related to the building as well, whether the building is actually BREEAM um, uh, certified or actually um, has photovoltaics or, or a particular garden area to cool, to cool down the surfaces. And the idea here is that the great majority of the clients are actually looking for not only a space where they're going to be bringing their employees, possibly more in a hybrid model, um, but also an area which is actually um, is, is, a, is a sustainable um, building as well, um, possibly a building that has certain standard sound insulation, um, air quality, and obviously um, access as well. So, um, so being able to actually have access for, you know, um, if people are actually walking or, or, or coming by, by bicycles as well. And I think this makes a huge difference. And it's been, it's been the, the driver for the great majority of the, of the requests that we have from clients at the moment. Um, the, uh, the idea here is we, we provide information, the critical information that our clients need, including the digital models, but very quickly to allow them to identify and to shortlist. So your client may, may come with 20 properties um, but they don't have time to actually go to 20 properties and visit 20 properties, having a digital twin, having all the data in one place, in one application, allows to make a decision from 20 to five in an hour, hour and a half. And that is effectively what we speed up the transaction times and we, we allow to save so much time for our clients as well. Yeah, I, I see here, it, it's as fast as 85% um, faster transaction time. That's, that's incredible. Tell us more about... Yeah some of the results you're seeing and also some of the reactions that you're hearing from some of these multinational yep. executives. So, so we also run um, where, I mean, after all, Next is actually an experience. Um, and we're running effectively as it was an experience if it was a service for any other, any other company as well. So we also run um, customer satisfaction surveys to understand what is actually what makes um, our clients so excited about coming to the room, but also understanding all the data that is contained there. Um, and we actually have at the moment, we, we hit 8.5% 8, 8 satisfaction rate, which is actually quite large considering you know, the complexity of the systems and the fact that we're running multiple countries at the same time. Um, the most important element is that our clients tend to, when we ask them to, to, to explain a bit more detail is that they're surprised they've never seen anything like this before from any other company. Um, they, they are extremely excited to be able to save time, especially when they are selecting offices across multiple countries on one go. Uh, so instead of having to actually hop on a plane, go to Madrid or go to Frankfurt or go to Paris, they can come to London or, or, or to Paris, for example, if they want to see, say, Singapore properties um, without having to actually fly to all this, these countries and actually making decisions very quickly on the spot. And especially now um, with restrictions in, in terms of entry and because of COVID and stuff like that, this makes a huge amount of difference um, to, to our clients as well. It's wonderful. And, and you're actually seeing a trend where a lot of the trans recent transactions are zero touch. Correct. Um, tell, tell us a little bit more about that. So, so zero touch is, is something that happened during, during last year where basically we couldn't rely on a client to come to our offices to sign contracts, but also we couldn't rely to actually do meetings either. So everything has to be online. So we developed the ability to, to actually not only visit the properties and identify the properties that they want to actually see, see the multiple maps as well, and the, the models as well, to see if the properties were suitable. And in some cases, which, which has happened uh, in the UK and in France as well, we have zero touch transactions where the client didn't even come to the office to actually sign the lease or, or, or the contracts as well. So effectively, everything was carried out digitally. 
um, and it was the first time, effectively, out of out of necessity to actually, you know, re remove all the contact between between people. Um, I think I don't think it's going to continue 100%, but I think it's actually proven that we have the technology, we have the, the ability to do this, and it actually is another element that we talk about about faster transaction times. If it's a small transaction and it doesn't require a huge amount of complexity, um, zero touch makes a lot of sense because it's much quicker. So obviously, it's it's something that is now built in into into the kind of into the product as well. Um, I know when when we think about commercial real estate, there's just you know so much opportunity uh, to digitize spaces globally, mm -hmm. um, just to provide that that level of service uh, to to clients such as JLL's clients. Um, and I know probably some of our attendees, regardless of you know, the industry or vertical that they're in, they're wondering how they can scale faster in digitizing their spaces. Um, for greater efficiencies. And I understand um, your, your EMEA, your Europe-based team is quite independent um, in capturing commercial spaces. Um, and that, you know, just in order to sort of keep up with the demand that you, that you from a North America and an um, and an Asia Pacific mm -hmm. perspective, that you're, you're partnering with our capture services team, where we actually right. are able to send a capture tech out and, and capture those spaces very efficiently on behalf of JLL. Um, can you share a little bit more mm -hmm. um, about your strategy there and what the experience has been like just in terms of scaling faster and, and digitizing yeah. your spaces? Yeah, so um, EMEA has always been uh, independent and we, we decided to align the whole process of, of hosting and storing the models um, across the world. So Americas, EMEA and APAC. Um, the objective of that, it means that we give us single access um, and also means that, you know, the next service can actually has a single repository to actually grab all the all the multiple models anywhere. So the second strategy as well is the fact that as we move into APAC, we have a, a, a next office in Singapore as well. Um, we, we needed a consistent experience and a consistent experience in terms of ca capturing all those spaces as well. Um, we do have that experience in the US, but it was actually not as standardized. So we standardized the process in, in APAC and we made it stand, you know, obviously um, consistent to, to the one that uh, we have in Americas as well. So that means that uh, whether you are in, in APAC or, or in the US or, or in EMEA, there's a standardized capture process, um, whether it's actually provided through multiple or our third parties. But in particular, APAC um, was a big challenge because we we actually de deploy multiple capital um, multiple uh, capital services through multiple directly, and that allows us to actually have the scope um, due to the fact that the deployment for Next was uh, requiring a lot of models to be captured as well, um, and we have seven countries already covered in the in the APAC um, capture services deployment already, which is very exciting. Very exciting indeed. Um, well, thank you for sharing um, sharing your story and where you are in your journey, Rosinda. Um, thank you, sir. Absolutely. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to just continue to type them type them on, and we're gonna we're gonna pivot over to our next uh, case study, which um, we're gonna take a look at an inspiring story from CRB. Chris, thank you for being here today. Um, so let's pivot over to the pharmaceutical and biotech industry, shall we? Sure. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so happy to have you here. Um, so I know CRB has been involved in over 20 projects related to bringing COVID-19 vaccines and uh, treatments or therapies to market. Um, before we jump into the demo that you've prepared, can you share a little bit of background about how CRB is, is helping biotech and pharma companies during this critical time? Sure. Um, so a lot of um, our clients are obviously, you know, heavy tech focused um, biopharma companies that are involved in producing these, uh, you know, life-saving vaccinations and things like that. So a lot of uh, what our shift was last year was with COVID and travel restrictions and all of that, we had to find a way to get our engineers and vendors into these facilities, which were typically being retrofitted. Most of them were not, you know, greenfield ground up um, facilities, but we we're modifying an existing facility uh, to meet the needs uh, to produce the, the vaccinations or the, the other um, 
uh, products that, that our, our clients are making. So uh, Matterport was a, was a fantastic solution to be able to capture those spaces and be able to share that with a globally disconnected team, right? We have vendors in, in Europe that are providing equipment that needs to interface with some existing equipment that is already there. So uh, being able to eliminate the travel costs and be able to get everybody together in a room uh, looking at a Matterport tour to be able to, to make some actionable design decisions was really, really critical for us to keep moving uh, last year during all of the, the you know, travel restrictions and COVID. Absolutely. Um, it's uh, Paul, Paul touched on earlier the importance of digital twinge for visualization, for spatial data, and just a collaborative um, a, a collab collaboration during the design reviews that you're describing. Um, I'm hoping we can jump into to your demo now and you can actually share a little bit with our attendees on, on how you're using Matterport to do just that. Sure. Um, so one of the, the greatest things that I've seen come from Matterport since we've been a customer with them is the advent of a couple of new tools that are in beta right now. Uh, one of them is the notes function. And uh, what this allows you to do is basically attach data uh, to the Matterport tour, but you can also then identify or tag somebody uh, to be able to ask a question or to gain information. Um, and what that does is it allows us to very easily ask some questions that are tied to the, the, the digital asset, right, that are, that are in the space so that you can very easily see kind of what we're pointing at or what we're trying to get a, a piece of information from and very easily then communicate that with the party that we need the information from. So in these cases, we're, we're basically using these notes and it automatically sends an email out to the people with a link directly to the Matterport tour that will bring them into the space and show them the note where the question is so that they're seeing the actionable information that we're trying to get, uh, where it's located in the space, um, so uh, it's very easy for us to interact from different disjointed design teams or to get valuable information and feedback from operations and facility staff who have carnal knowledge of these existing facilities. Uh, the other tool that, that uh, is in beta right now that I just got my first uh, taste of last week is scan to bin um, So now you can go out, uh, scan a Matterport tour, um, and in, it's in beta, but they basically generate a Revit model for us, um, saving us an incredible amount of time to not only uh, not have to download the point cloud and then model based off of the point cloud, but they're generating a Revit model for us to start from. So it's a level 200, LOD 200 model to start from, and it allows us a great jumping off point uh, to uh, not have to basically model those existing conditions from the beginning. Um, there you see in that image too, one of the, the nicest things that we see about the Matterport tours is the, the resolution and the detail that we get out of the images that are captured. It allows us to, to zoom in and read tags and labels on the existing space allows us to then very easily kind of piece together the puzzle based on existing drawings or conditions that may not be documented accurately on those existing conditions. And then we can very easily uh, validate those existing drawings by looking through the Matterport tour. That is a great demo, Chris. Um, I wanna to touch on notes that I know you've been um, You've been uh, part of the open beta now. It is an open beta, so it's available to, to all Matterport um, customers and users. Um, I'm curious, you know, because you, you engage, um, you know, with your clients, and, and Paul touched on that ability to make critical decisions, to inform decisions, you know, what's been the reaction of your clients as you've been testing out notes betas, just in terms of being able to collaborate within this space? Um, what, what's their reaction um, as, as they've been as they've been in the beta alongside you. So yeah, the, the great thing is, is obviously Matterport in general has been a great tool for us to, to be able to engage the owner, to walk through a space, to clarify scope, to uh, you know, identify challenges that might be a part of the project. 
But now this gives a, an additional way for us to easily ask those questions, which then points them right back to the facility tour and says, hey, what is this thing? Or, hey, what are we doing with this thing? Um, to be able to uh, easily gather that information. Um, and there in that piece of the demo, you can also attach documents to these notes. So um, for example, if we were looking at a control solution or something like that, and we wanted to get some, some client feedback, we can not only uh, attach a note, but we can attach the proposed cut sheet of what we're planning on using for that specific control that then is embedded in that note. So when that client then goes over um, and clicks on the link that they get from the email, that note is already there. The cut sheet is already there for them to download to be able to, to tell us whether or not immediately, whether we're headed the right direction with that design decision. So it's been fantastic for uh, that quick communication that we need to get these projects done in a much faster time period. And um, that's 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 incredible to get the feedback um, in such a rapid time. And, and what is that? You know, what are you seeing in terms of results? I know you've just started piloting the, the public beta of notes, um, but you know, even prior to that, what were some of the efficiency gains and results that you helped clients achieve, particularly over the course of the last year? using yeah using um so plans. so so obviously you know reduction in travel costs was was huge for us right a lot of times when we go and retrofit these spaces we send a team of you know five to ten engineers out on site to be able to walk the space get all of the information that they need to be able to um to to modify the design for the client's needs well now we don't have to send those people out, right? We've captured everything virtually, so we've saved a, a, an incredible amount of travel expense for the client just to get us engaged in the project. So that's a easy ROI, right? That's that's super easy to, to justify. But then not only that, but a lot of times um, the decision-making process, trying to get an owner to understand the questions that we're asking um, is sometimes the harder part. So with, uh, in this case, the Matterport tour, or uh, like you're seeing here, a Navisworks uh, model of the current model with the point cloud laid over the top from Matterport um, allows us to very easily um, point them to the right uh, so to have the data right there available for them to be able to respond to our questions, to kind of easily uh, get them the information that we're looking to get back from them so that they know right where we're looking, right what we're talking about, and right what we need uh, in order to get the answer and the design completed. And you know what are you hearing from clients as you as you close out a project? I'm sure they probably want a di the most recent digital twin to document the the work that's been complete. And and what are you hearing in terms of you know what you're visioning or requests that you're hearing from clients in terms of some of the things that that Paul um, touched on could be in the way of operations or field service like as the project completes, but they're they're looking at all the efficiencies that they've gained at the digital twin. What are they what are they visioning with you moving forward um, and how they can use digital twins in their ongoing operations? Yeah, so a lot of that is is trying to tie right the rest of the the information piece to the Matterport tour. So uh, we're looking at methodologies like um, using BIM 360, for example, to capture all of that data, but then embedding links in the Matterport tour that take you right to that document repository on BIM 360 docs, which now allows you to have all of your operations and maintenance manuals right there at the fingertips of the operators as they're navigating the Matterport space. So we're looking at ways to not only get the data in the, in the hands, but now also looking at how can we leverage, uh, say, the Matterport SDK and some of the other programming uh, solutions that we have to start connecting the data that's being fed from the facility back to the digital twin. So we're working on some, some dashboards and some things like that for our clients that are gonna start connecting uh, the data back to feed the model from the physical facility as Paul was discussing. That's that's wonderful. When I think of pharma too, when you think about you know distributed operations that a lot of the major um, pharma providers across you know around the, the globe offer um, different facilities in different different regions of the world, 
Um, I'm sure it's a huge learning, especially in, in times where they haven't been able to travel, but their operations are so critical that they that they be able to, sh to share the information globally um, and have access, um, you know, like just, just across all their operations globally. What, what are you hearing from clients there in terms of building building the library? You know, yeah. Yeah. So ultimately for us, we're, we're finding that a lot more of our clients are already Matterport customers, right? So as we have, have jumped in, engaged in the Matterport solution, um, it becomes a great uh, way for us to continue to hand over that data to them and basically exchange it back and forth. So when we get done with the project, we can uh, do the as-built scan. We already have the, the pre-construction scan. So we've got a sequence of scans from the whole construction process and we can turn that whole thing over to our clients so it becomes a living breathing um, uh, asset for them to manage um, and then once they continue to manage it they can give it back to us for our next project as things have been modified or they've injected additional data to it so it's become a a great solution for us to not only hand over data to them but that for them to manage that data and then hand it back to us when we come back and do the next project Absolutely. Um, I know it's so critical to um, Paul touched on, you know, the, the various um, the various uh, partners that are involved in, in providers, vendors um, that are involved in, in any kind of, you know, project. In this case, in pharma, you could have um, a, a pharma facility that's based in North America, but the manufacturer of the critical equipment is based in Europe. So I know this is that the Matterport's really been been a bridge there. Can, can you share a little bit about how you, you know, you've been able to gain some efficiencies there for your clients. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, obviously last year with travel restrictions and um, things like that, we couldn't get vendors to come to sites, right? You know, especially if they were in Europe trying to come across uh, the pond just wasn't an option. So uh, Matterport was our solution to be able to easily grab that information, sit on a meeting with these vendors and show them where we were needing uh, to, to integrate their new equipment in with the existing pieces of equipment and grab, you know, measurements, uh, all of those kind of things that allow them to, to make some actionable decisions on what they needed to do to make this piece of equipment and to adapt it to what we needed uh, to, to, you know, modify that piece of equipment for the new use case. So wonderful. Well, thank, thank you for sharing your story, Chris. And um, just such such great case studies today. Um, I think that we can uh, head on into the Q&A and see if our audience has some additional questions for you and for Paul and for Rosendo. Great, thank you so much for having me, Sarah. It's been great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I have my colleague on, Amir Frank. I think Amir is gonna jump on and join us and maybe bubble up to the top some of the great questions that have been coming in during today's webinar. Yes. Hey, Sarah. Thanks. Great webinar, everybody. I really appreciate all the information. I'm, I'm learning a lot from this, actually. Uh, okay, so Art asked about, there's a lot of questions that are coming in for the uh, scan to BIM. That seems to be a very popular uh, <laughs> topic, and it is it is uh, still in beta. I'm trying to get some information. I uh, haven't been able to regarding how to get into that beta and whether that's just available for everybody. So Art, I can maybe give you just a little bit of input. By all uh, means. I've done, I've done one so far, right? I've just got involved in the beta and it was a fairly complex mechanical room uh, with multiple levels, cable tray, pipe, duct, big air handling units, all of that kind of stuff. And I was ex extremely pleased and impressed with what I got back. Now it is level LOD 200 stuff. So you're talking, you know, boxes and stuff like that. It's not going to be you know, bolts and screw kind of uh, detail that you're going to get from this model, but it does give you all of the vertical horizontal surfaces, all of the pipe runs, duct runs as they sit, as they were captured from the Matterport tour. So I've been extremely impressed with what I've seen so far. And there's a lot of talk about the uh, the accuracy being it can only be as accurate as, you know, the, the camera used to scan it, whether it's Matterport Pro 2 or BLK. Uh, and then there's also the person who's doing the sketching themselves and how accurate they are. And what, what's your experience with that been? Yeah. So, I mean, right now, obviously it is based on the accuracy of the tour itself. So, uh, 
obviously you, you have to, to do a good job at the scanning portion, right? The more data that you collect, the more refined the, the data that Matterport's going to have for, you, for them to start that modeling from. So of course, a, a good scan is, is, is definitely the, the good start. Uh, but most of the time, the accuracy isn't that big of a deal for us unless we're trying to thread the needle of a pipe through, you know, a pipe rack or something like that. So uh, in our use case, the accuracy isn't as critical. Um, and if we do, then we would use a BLK or something like that in order to get that heavier data. Um, and then we would use that to actually jumpstart the scan to BIM. Yeah. And I, I mentioned in, in one of my comments that uh, notes, you talked about notes, Chris. Um, that's something that another like future phase of notes is to be able to actually take on site notes. So as the technician is going around scanning, actually in capture itself, uh, you'll be able to take notes. And so I see that maybe being able to take more accurate measurements than what the camera, because you're there live. Uh, so somebody who knows what they're doing can take those measurements of the you know pipes and whatnot and transfer that information to the, you know, people, the service and, you know, people who are making the BIM. Yeah, that's that's a great point, Amir. I mean, the more data that you inject pre-scan to BIM, the, the more accurate you're going to get. So. Yeah. Uh, all right. Fantastic. So it does look like we have uh, a few more questions in here. Um, I just, you know, by all means, invite anybody uh, on the panel who's got the Q&A panel open and you see a question that pertains to you and your expertise, uh, feel free to answer it. I'm just going to look through. We've had some questions also come in through chat. It does make it a little bit easier if they come in through the Q and A panel. Uh, just FYI, but uh, but I'll look at I'll look at both. Um, I can grab the one from Ryan there on VR headset versus. Oh yeah, I was gonna, computer. Please, I, I have no uh, idea. Yeah, um, you know it, it varies. Um, a lot of people I'm finding are somewhat uncomfortable in the VR space, right? So it it does give them the option. Um, uh, some people love the VR experience and love to be in it. It gives them the more immersive kind of um, uh, detail that they're looking for. But I would say probably 80 to 90 percent use the traditional mouse and a computer to navigate the space in their everyday environment. Um, occasionally, when we'll do model reviews or, or Matterport reviews, we'll have goggles available in the room with us so that if somebody wants to get in and actually have a better feel of what that space is, then they can do that very easily directly from uh, the same Matterport that we're looking at. Uh, a question also came in from Lowell. Uh, as a Matterport operator, how do we start these conversations with landlords who may know nothing about virtual tours and its capabilities for ongoing building management? Um, that may be for you, Rosendo. Or... Yeah, so I think it's uh, the great majority of the conversations start with landlords talking to brokers and usually it's brought by the fact that the landlords come to us. Um, we have effectively um, negotiated um, some some agreements with multiple which allow us to actually provide a better service and a more integrated service instead of multiple suppliers. So I think it's um, I think in the case of Europe, for example, we have the ability for the for the actual landlords to contact us directly, um, and in some cases we actually go to the properties directly uh, because we suggest to the landlord this is a a, a large opportunity. Which needs to be um, we need to be scanned and, and and we take the responsibility of doing that as well. So it's a bit of a mixture, and it depends on the case and the size and the complexity as well. Uh, there was a question earlier. I think Paul addressed it um, to to um, one of our attendees uh, asking about uh, the concept of virtual plants. And I, Paul, if you want to elaborate on that, and I also wanted to mention, I think I think Paul's referencing it. Um, one of our platform partners, Remsens, has a solution called Virtual Plant, and so as it relates to oil and gas, and as it relates to you know even cleaner, efficient energy, um, you might check out that that solution um, by Remsens. We just published a, a case study up on our website on that as well. If you want some additional examples about um, you know kind of remote operations and what's possible with more of that that virtual plant um, solution um, and opportunities there. 
Yes, and the question was from Gavin, who was saying, you know, is, are there any examples of digital twins in offshore oil, oil and gas platforms and any information on using augmented reality on a digital twin? And you know, on the first piece, yes, absolutely. I'm seeing huge amounts of interest in the oil and gas space or more broadly the energy space as, as we look at renewables as well. Um, Shell, for example, requiring digital twins for every new asset they buy and working back through their back catalog to build those twins for the older assets. Adnoc in the Middle East, um, building a, a huge digital wall that allows them to see data coming from across 16 divisions and allows them to then start making those, those you know, informed decisions about how to operate that business. But on, on the, the AR and VR piece, VR in particular, virtual reality being used um, if you're going into a complex or dangerous environment, like an oil rig in the North Sea, um, to work out how you're going to do that task before you're actually there, to allow that, that team to work in a virtual environment, you know, will I be able to move these big pieces of machinery through the space? Can I navigate from where the helicopter lands to where I need to do the work? Um, what are some of the implications and challenges I might encounter on the way? And practice all of that on land safely and then go out on, into the field and you're able to do the task much better as a result. Uh, so seeing you know, examples of that as well. And then on the AR side, it touches on some of the stuff Chris was showing in his demo, using augmented reality and IoT, the Internet of Things, you know, to have real-time views perhaps of uh, readings from, from um, equipment. So real-time views of pressure or temperature or whatever it may be moving through those pipes you could see in Chris's diagram. So you're seeing the, the Matterport scan showing you the physical space and then just a little tag, perhaps one of your notes, you know, showing you what the, the, the real reading is right now to allow you to make informed decisions. We see that used for things like um, tag out processes in, in manufacturing. Is this asset actually off and actually disconnected from power before I stick my hand in? Um, that that kind of thing, and and then you know, other related tasks around there as well. So yes, lots of overlap, lots of pieces of work being done. Um, not a lot at huge scale yet, but lots of nice examples pointing to the direction um, of what's possible. Very good. We will unfortunately not have enough time for all of the questions that are coming in. More and more are are coming in. Um, I did just want to address one. Um, is there a way to work with Matterport to bring back 3D models from CAD software in the Matterport model? Uh, yes, we are looking at that. So if you do have an E57 file from CAD, um, you can send it directly to me, afrank at matterport.com, um, and we'll make a Matterport model out of that. And that just kind of simplifies navigation. Um, so hopefully that helps. With that said, we are at time. So really appreciate it. Thank you so much to Paul, to Chris, to Rosendo. We uh, really appreciate it. Well, um, as I mentioned, we'll be sending out the recording of today's webinar if you'd like to share that with some of your colleagues as well. And um, we'll also be sending out some of the written um, case studies that we produced with a CRB um, as well as JLL. Um, and, and Paul, we're so grateful to have you here. We hope to have you back um, to help us co-host uh, webinars in, in the future here as well. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for giving us an hour of your time as well. Yes. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.